<laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's um, webinar on trauma informed basics. My name is Todd Scholl. We'll get started at exactly seven o'clock. So hang on. Getting that live stream going. Hope you're doing well tonight. For those of you waiting, invite you to join the SCEA. Check out the SCEA.org. That's our website. We'd love to have you as a part of our movement to deliver the students that, I mean, the schools that our South Carolina students and educators deserve. All right, it's seven o'clock. So we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Todd Scholl. I am the Professional Practice and Policy Teaching Fellow for the South Carolina Education Association, also doing work with the NEA, very proud member of both associations. And um, welcome to tonight's session on Trauma Informed Basics. This is one of many webinars that we'll be doing this year. And you can learn more about the webinars at, um, at the plan website. And that is, uh, you can find links to that. Colleen can put that in the comments, um, the, the link to the plan website, and then just look for um, uh, the webinar uh, a link at the top navigation. We've got a lot of great um, other, uh, other great sessions that we can come and do at your school. You can take a look at the other sessions that we offer through uh, the plan, which stands for Professional Learning and Networking. The SCEA is committed to helping our public schools connect with really great facilitators for professional learning for your um, faculty. And we would love to come do some in person, or we can set it up online. And this is all um, done through the SCEA. Just uh, all you have to do is fill out the PD request form and we will connect with you and, and get something set up. So let's go ahead and get started with tonight's session. Let me share my screen. And we are off. So uh, Colleen, you could pop in and let me know if you can't see my screen, but if you can, I'm gonna go ahead and keep, keep starting. I wanna go ahead and do, um, whoops, I need to hit full screen here. Okay, good. All right. So, Colleen, are we looking good? I'm going to check the chat. Just make sure we're looking good. Can you give me a thumbs up if we're looking good in the chat for me? Yes. Okay, we are good. All right. So, I want to start with um, our land acknowledgement tonight. We begin by acknowledging that we meet on the traditional land served by the Waccamaw people. That's where I'm broadcasting from. And we honor America's first people and all elders past, present, and emerging. Um, uh, we're going to skip this check-in for now because some people are watching um, asynchronously. But tonight, uh, when, you're, when you're watching this, uh, if you're engaged in this, just stay engaged and um, you may experience some discomfort. Um, uh, just allow others to participate. If you do come in and you're commenting, um, you know, please be respectful. We're going to honor the time. And if at any point you feel uncomfortable, you can mute or opt out. Um, we're going to start off with a mindfulness practice, then we're going to get into what does it mean to be trauma informed, what are adverse childhood experiences, what are the physical impacts of trauma, what is positive, tolerable, and toxic stress, the mental impacts of trauma, academic and behavioral impacts of trauma, the impacts on teachers, um, and some misconceptions about trauma informed teaching. And then if we have time, we'll do a, a, a compassion practice. Um, I'm not sure we're going to be able to get all through all of that in an hour, but we're going to try to do as much of it as we can. Um, I saw this meme and I wanted to share this um, with you. There's a real reason a lot of, uh, I've been doing professional development and connecting with teachers and morale is very low, stress is very high. And there's a real legitimate reason if you're feeling, uh, someone today, a teacher told me, I'm, look, I'm on the struggle bus. And so many other teachers raised their hands and said, me too, me too, me too. And there's a real reason why you feel that way right now. Um, uh, the psychological reason for this has to do with something called surge capacity. So surge capacity is a collection of adaptive systems, mental and physical, that humans draw on for short-term survival in acutely stressful situations such as natural disasters. So this is a good thing, surge capacity. The problem is that our surge capacity only allows us to adapt to major disasters if they are temporary. But with the pandemic, the disaster stretches out indefinitely and the emergency phase has now become chronic. And what we're dealing with is, is similar to what this person's dealing with. It feels like 
we have been doing this for two years now. Uh, something that and it just seems like it's never ending, like the, the battle that we're in and the, the, um, the, the feelings of stress and the feelings of being overwhelmed. That was already there prior to the pandemic, but with the pandemic coming in, it's made things so much worse. So because this is going on and on and on, your surge capacity is depleted and needs to be renewed. Things you can do to feel better. Number one, accept that life is a little bit different right now. For some people, it's a lot different. And that you're not going to hear a lot of other people say this, but I am going to tell you, expect less from yourself. You don't hear that. Usually motivational speakers are like, expect more from yourself. I'm saying maybe we need to expect less from ourselves. Recognize the different aspects of grief. Look for activities new and old that uh, continue to fulfill you. Focus on maintaining and strengthening important relationships. Build regular practices into your life that promote resilience, such as better sleep, good nutrition, exercise, meditation, self-compassion, and saying no. The reason why I'm starting with that and with the mindfulness practice is because we, when we start talking about trauma, it can be a very heavy weight. And I've seen a lot of teachers say, you know, it's like, I've already got so much weight on me. I, I'm, I'm dealing with, you know, planning and grading and, you know, there's, we don't have an, we're understaffed and I'm having to fill in for other teachers. And there's just so much stress that they're experiencing. They're like, dude, I can't deal with having to be trained about trauma and deal with all of that. And, you know, I'm not a counselor. I get, I get that. That's not what we're really trying to do is to add more. What we're trying to do really is to have a, have a shift in focus and a shift in understanding where maladaptive behaviors come from, the importance of, um, of our school systems addressing trauma early because of the connection to some very serious outcomes in adulthood. And this is a, really, it's a moral imperative. And I'm going to, I'm going to make the case for that tonight. It's a moral imperative for every educator no matter what grade level you teach, no matter what subject you teach, no matter where you fit into the system, where you're, whether you're an educator, a curriculum coach, an administrator, uh, wh whatever, it, all of us need to understand trauma uh, and, and how trauma impacts young people on into their adulthood. It is powerful. It's critical information for you to know. So I hope that you really focus tonight. But when we take that on and when we start talking about it, it can, it's unquestionable, it can be stressful to talk about, partially because a lot of us have experienced trauma in our lives, whether it was in childhood or adulthood, a lot of us have experienced traumatic events. So when we start talking about trauma, it can make us remember some of the traumas we've endured or experienced through our lives. And so I always want to, on the front end of this discussion, start with please take good care of yourself. And one of the ways you can do that is through a mindfulness practice. So we're going to do a quick three minute mindfulness practice. How you do this, if you've never done it before, is you sit comfortably with your back straight, um, uncross your legs, put both feet on the floor, put your hands in your lap, get comfortable. If you notice any tension anywhere in your body, just kind of loosen that up, but sit up upright, and then close your eyes if you're comfortable doing that. And if you're not, just find a spot in front of you to gaze at, just stare at that one spot. I like to close my eyes during this practice. What you're gonna do is you're gonna focus on your breath. And the reason why we focus on the breath is that's going to be our anchor to the present moment. Mindfulness is paying attention on purpose to the present moment. John Kabat-Zinn kind of puts it that way, without judgments and labels about what's happening in the present moment. The breath is occurring in the present moment. So if I can focus and pay attention on, the, on my breath, then I'm being mindful. So we're going to focus on the sensation of your breath wherever you feel it the most. For some, that may be in your nose, some in your throat, your chest, your abdomen. But I want you to focus on the sensation of your breath. Inhale, exhale. Focus on all the entire breath cycle. Inhale and exhale. Now, what's going to happen is your brain is going to want to play time travel. And you probably notice, you'll notice, start noticing this after I mention it, that you do this a lot. You time travel to the past. So you're thinking about things that happened earlier today or earlier this week. 
or you time travel to the future because you're thinking about things that are going to happen later or maybe next week and Thanksgiving, things like that. So we tend to time travel rather than being focused on the present moment. So we're going to notice that when our mind wants to shift us away from the breath and we're lost in a thought, as soon as we notice that, we acknowledge it and then we just gently shift our attention back to the breath. This does not mean you're bad at this practice. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It's completely and totally normal for you to, um, uh, to, to, to do that. It's, it's absolutely normal. That is the practice. So I want you to continue that process. Continue to focus on your breath. Notice the cool air coming in, the warm air as it goes out, the rising of the chest and the abdomen, the falling of the chest and the abdomen. The sensation of your lungs being filled with air, the sensation of them, of the air going out. And as you lose focus on your breath, try to take a note of what it was you thought about that distracted you from the breath. Then go, oh yeah, breath, and then go back to your breath. So I'm going to be quiet for a full minute and let you do that. Stay with your breath. You can count your breaths if that helps. Now I want you to take some deep breaths. And when I do, mean deep, I mean really fill your lungs up with air and slowly, just a nice deep breath, and then hold it for a count of three or four, whatever's comfortable. Hold your breath in and then exhale. And you can audibly exhale each time. So deep breath in and hold two, three, and then exhale. Take a few breaths like that at your own pace. And as you breathe in, you're breathing in balance, relaxation, a sense of centeredness and equanimity. And as you exhale, you're letting go of tensions, allowing things to be as they are. <sighs> Feeling that tension kind of wash away. You can do this practice every day. Maybe start off with five minutes and see how it makes you feel. Maybe move up to 10 to 20 minutes a day. This is going to be important practice because when we talk about how we deal effectively with trauma, one of the key components is going to be your capacity as an educator to emotionally stay regulated. And staying emotionally regulated is what's going to help you uh, from creating more trauma for a, for students. And, uh, that takes practice and training to, to, to be able to emotionally stay regulated. It's really hard work. This is the practice for that though. This is one of the best things you can do to help you stay emotionally regulated. They've done studies to show that the cortisol level of the teacher correlates to the cortisol levels of the students. They, they can test the saliva. So as the cortisol or stress hormones of the educator go up, they tend to go up with the students as well. When they come down, they tend to come down with the students. So you are the, one of the key components. You are probably the component of the culture and climate of your classroom. If you can remain calm and regulated, then your students are more likely to stay calm and regulated.
I saw this um, and this really, it was really powerful to me. Instead of viewing your most difficult students as a burden, think of them as an opportunity to do your best work. So what does it mean to be trauma informed? Let's dig right into that definition. I want to um, tell you um, the, the best way I heard this framed, and I can't remember who said this, um, is, but the best way I've heard it framed is we're gonna stop asking students what's wrong with you and start asking what happened to you. Because we start with a fundamental proposition when a student misbehaves, we start off with a proposition, this student is bad, there's something wrong with, with them. And what we need to do, what we figure out is what happened? What were the causes and conditions that led to this effect that we're seeing? So we have a tendency in education to focus on effects, but never to look at the causal links to those effects. So instead, what we do is we see the maladaptive behavior, we label the child bad, we punish them, but we never really do a, a great job of digging into the causes of the maladaptive behavior. We assume that it's just this fundamental or inherent flaw in, in, in the child. And that is a, that's kind of an old fashioned way of looking at it. We've got to look at what neuroscience and psychology is, what those fields are saying to us. And that is that there are causes and conditions for maladaptive behaviors. So Tish Jennings, Dr. Tish Jennings out of the University of Virginia wrote an amazing book. It's, I consider it almost like the Bible of what we're talking about tonight. The it's called The Trauma Sensitive Classroom. You can get it on Amazon or your favorite bookstore. Um, it, she says that trauma-informed practices are educational practices that cultivate a safe learning environment and mitigate the impact of trauma symptoms on learning. These practices create a school culture to which students can bond and from which they can derive social support. So what does it mean when we talk about trauma? Tish puts it this way. Trauma is an event, a series of events or set of circumstances experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. I want to take a pause here. I want you to, at some point, you can open a new tab if you want to, go to Facebook, if you're on Facebook, and go to the Trauma Informed Educators Network and connect with that page. I think that's, I don't know if it's a page or a group, I can't remember, but connect or like it or follow it or whatever it is. Um, Matthew Portell, I believe is the one who started this. He's an administrator at a school in Nashville. Um, it's a wonderful way to stay connected to the, the latest information, research um, and so forth on being trauma informed and lots of great resources are shared in that network. So I encourage you to do that. So a lot of this work in terms of being trauma informed came out of a, a study that was done on 17,000 people in the late nineties by the uh, company Kaiser Permanente. And what they did was they followed 17,000 um, adults and they asked them about their adverse childhood experiences um, and they followed them and found out what kind of outcomes um, they had and, and started to sort of link uh, adverse childhood experiences with health outcomes, social outcomes, and so forth in adulthood. So that's what adverse ACEs stand. If you ever hear someone say ACEs or ACEs score, ACEs is an acronym for adverse childhood experiences. And they, they put them, those ACEs into 10 categories um, under three sort of overarching uh, areas. So the three areas are abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. Under abuse, you have physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. Under neglect, physical and emotional abuse. And under household dysfunction, you have mental illness, an incarcerated relative, a mother treated violently, substance abuse, and divorce. So those are the 10 ACEs. And we're going to go ahead and take the ACEs quiz. Now, I'm just going to give everybody a little bit of a trigger warning. We're, this, this may make you think about some things that were difficult in, in your life. If you feel like that could be problematic for you, pause or stop the, this video um, and come back to it another time, or you can skip ahead after this section. But we're going to take the same quiz that those 17,000 uh, original people um, took, and they've been continuing to follow up on those studies to, to, to solidify 
what they believe are the links that they've found. Um, and they continue to do research on these ACEs. So uh, we're going to take that ACEs quiz. And what I need you to do to get your ACEs score is just keep track of the number of times you say answer yes to these questions. So you can count on your fingers or put a little uh, mark down on a piece of paper. But basically, every time you say yes, you're going to you know, count up like a point. OK, and that's going to be your ACEs score at the end is how many we're going to add those up. Okay, so here's the first one. Before your 18th birthday, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid that you might be physically hurt? If you say yes to that, just hold, just mark down one. Two, before your 18th birthday, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? Number three, before your 18th birthday, did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you or have you touch their body in a sexual way or attempt or actually have oral, anal, or vaginal intercourse with you? Number four, before your 18th birthday, did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other? Number five. Before your 18th birthday, did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, and had no one to protect you, or your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you or to take you to the doctor if you needed it? Number six, before your 18th birthday, was a biological parent ever lost to you through divorce, abandonment, or other reason? Number seven, before your 18th birthday, was your mother or stepmother often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her, or sometimes often or very often kicked, bitten, hit with a fist or hit with something hard, or ever repeatedly hit at least, or, uh, at least a few minutes or threatened with a gun or knife? Number eight, before your 18th birthday, did you live with anyone who was a problem drinker or alcoholic or who used street drugs? Number nine, before your 18th birthday, was a household member depressed or mentally ill, or did a household member attempt suicide? And number 10, before your 18th birthday, did a household member go to prison? So now you've been asked those 10 questions, and however many times you answered yes, that's your score. And I want you to keep that score in mind as we look at the following uh, information, okay? So we're going to keep that in mind as we review the following few slides. So this was um, the data, how common ACEs are. So 36% of people who went through that 10-question um, um, quiz had no, answered no every single time. So they had zero yeses. So that's 36%. 26% had one, 16% had two. 9.5% had three and 12.5% said four or more. So I want you to think about how that would translate to your classroom, okay? So if you had a classroom of say 21, about seven of them would say zero, which means 14 of them have experienced at least one of those things. And 20%, so would it be about four of them would have three or more times they would say yes. So you Matt, can imagine what some of those, some of those kids um, are experiencing currently because so these ACEs may be something that they're currently going through, currently experiencing, or that they have experienced recently and their kids. So when we look at breakdown, remember there were the three sort of overarching categories of abuse, household challenges, neglect, um, under uh, abuse, 11% um, said yes to the emotional abuse. 28% said yes to the physical abuse. 21% said yes to the sexual abuse. Under household challenges, 13% have a mother, had a mother who's treated violently. 27% had someone in the house who has substance abuse issue. 19% with a mental health, mental Ill, uh, illness um, with an adult uh, a parent parental figure. 23% lost somebody due to separation divorce. 5% had an incarcerated household member. 15% experienced emotional neglect and 10% physical neglect. So what they found was, so they did this study, they asked these people that they gave these people that ACEs quiz. And then they started to ask them about some other things that happened. Like they asked them about their physical activity smoking, their, their drinking uh, 
habits, their drug use, how um, often they miss work, stuff like that. And they started to notice these correlations that the higher the ACE score, ACE score was, the more that they saw these behaviors, which is lack of physical activity, smoking, alcoholism, drug use, miss work, and these physical and mental health outcomes, severe obesity, diabetes, depression, suicide attempts, STDs, heart disease, cancer, stroke, COPD, broken bones. So this is why I say it's a moral imperative because trauma in childhood has these huge, huge impacts on into adulthood. We don't always make the connection. A lot of times um, trauma is suppressed. Um, it is buried deep in the psyche, but it manifests in adulthood in these behaviors and these physical and mental health outcomes. And one of the ways we can address that is by ensuring that our schools are built with uh, upon a trauma-informed uh, foundation, that everybody in the building from the bus driver when they first see in the morning to the cafeteria worker, to the custodian, to the teachers, to the nurse, school nurse, to the guidance counselors or our school counselors, the administration, that they are all versed in what it means to be trauma-informed so that we can help them feel safe and we can help them heal from these traumas. And so that we also can identify students who are going through this and get them the help that they need. If we continue not to do this, we are, we are not, I wouldn't say sentencing them, but there's a strong correlation between them, them going through that without healing and having all these negative outcomes in adulthood. We know what this is. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, we know that every, all our children need to uh, have their physiological needs met, but they also need to have their, their safety needs met. They need to feel uh, the sense of love and belonging and the sense of esteem. Um, these are foundational needs that humans have in order to flourish. And when we don't, ha when those needs aren't met, and in fact, the foundation is damaged, there can be all kinds of negative impacts. So let's look at some of the physical impacts of a high ACE score, ACEs score. What they found, if you look at this under the bottom, that's zero to, to five or more ACEs. The percentage uh, of people, respondents who report health problems, you can see how it goes up. The more ACEs someone has experienced, the more likely that those people have health problems. In fact, this is so powerful that the life expectancy of someone who has zero ACEs, a zero ACEs score is 80 years. Someone who, is, who said yes to six or more of those questions, their life expectancy is 60 years. So they lose 20 years of life lifespan on average than those with no ACEs. That is an incredible statistic. Um, if you are just becoming familiar, or even if you have been familiar and you haven't heard of a guy named Gabor Mate, I think that's how you pronounce his name. He is uh, one of the leaders in this field of understanding trauma. Um, I highly recommend um, um, this, the documentary, The Wisdom of Trauma. It features Gabor Mate's work. And I wanna play this clip for, um, from him. Um, so that you can kind of get a feel for who he is and what he what he's talking about. Traumatic events in childhood have a huge impact on the life course of the individual. We have all kinds of research now that first of all shows that the more trauma a child endures, exponentially greater the risk of that child as an adult to suffer mental illness, depression, anxiety, ADHD, addiction, and so on. And not only that, also autoimmune disease and cancer. To understand why, we have to understand what trauma is. So trauma is not the bad things that happen to you, but what happens inside you as a result of what happens to you. Trauma is an overwhelming threat that you don't know how to deal with. The first thing that happens in trauma is that you separate from yourself. So trauma fundamentally means a disconnection from self. Why do we get disconnected? 
because it's too painful to be ourselves. So I want to give you an example of what he means by becoming disconnected from yourself. So when a baby is, comes into this world, they have an attachment figure. So their mother their, or, and or their father or whoever it is that they're given to to take care of them. And all mammals, we need to feel loved to survive. So there is this primal fundamental need for that attachment figure to love us. And that relationship becomes critical and so important um, internally to us. And when we are ourselves as babies, one-year-old, two-year-olds, when we are our, our, when we are ourselves, and the attachment figure yells, hits, or for whatever reason withdraws or, or neglects when we are ourselves we learn to suppress ourselves and we become disconnected from ourselves and we will suppress aspects of our personality that um, push off, we, th we think um, push off that attachment figure or if we feel unloved from that attachment figure, um, we will blame it internally on ourselves and blame it internally on whatever our personality is. So we will suppress that, those aspects of our personality, which means we never become sort of self-actualized. We never figure out who we are. And a lot of kids can go through that sort of uh, dynamic all the way on into adulthood. And then they get to adulthood and they still haven't figured out exactly who they are because they've been, they've been trained from when, before they can even remember, um, They've been trained to suppress the, their authentic self. And Gabor Mate talks a lot about that in some of his videos. I highly recommend you check out more about that. It is critical for us to understand this because we've got to help students self-actualize. We've got to help students connect with themselves, bring out and tell them that we love them and that we care about them for who they are authentically. And kids, a lot of kids have, have sort of, because of the traumatic um, attachment relationship that they have, don't feel like they can truly be authentically themselves. So that's important. Gabor Mate talks about this and, and so many other things. Check out The Wisdom of Trauma, a really great documentary. As we, um, some of the other physical um, uh, things we go through include what's called a stress response. And I'm not gonna play that video. Um, but we've all felt stress, right? You felt the activation of stress when you get really upset about something. Um, the HPA axis goes off. That's the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal um, axis goes off and you feel this cascade of adrenaline, cortisol, and you can get jittery and you just feel agitated. Um, that, that stress response can actually be good in certain situations. You're out in the woods, you see a bear, you need to be able to run away or fight it off or whatever. We want, we want that, it's that stress response to happen because it gives us that adrenaline, that surge of energy and focus. It, it helps us breathe faster so we can run faster, gets more oxygen in the blood, that kind of thing, right? That's good. The problem is that um, when we're dealing with that level of stress on a regular basis, it, it, it's no longer a positive um, stress, it becomes toxic. So there's three different types of stress here we'll look at. There's positive stress, and this is the body's normal um, and healthy response to some type of tense situation or event, like your first day of school or work. That can be positive stress. Positive stress is normal. We're not gonna be necessarily get rid of all of that. It's kind of, we need to sometimes get primed for, for certain events. Tolerable stress is the activation of the body's stress response to some type of long lasting or severe situation. So this could be like you, the death of a family member. Um, but with tolerable stress, we have supportive buffers in place. And this is where, again, tying it back to education, we as trauma informed educators are part of that supportive buffer because students are going to go through um, stressful situations. They're going to lose family members. They're going to go through see, watch, sometimes watching their parents divorce or fight. They're going to see things happen in their neighborhood and we can help be that supportive buffer um, for them. 
Then there's toxic stress, and this is prolonged activation of that HPA axis um, to frequent intense in, uh, situations and events like witnessing domestic violence in the home, chronic neglect. This is, this is stuff that some kids are going through. They're going through toxic stress. This is going to do serious long-term damage to their physical and mental health if we don't get them the help they need. Tish Jennings says, positive stress involves typical and routine life challenges like falling off your bike, having an argument with your friend, or limited in duration and frequencies. These stressors can promote learning, problem solving, and coping skills, right? You fail some, at something, right? If you fail a test, you have a teacher that would say, listen, okay, you failed the test. That's stressful. What can we do? Let's work together to, to try to improve things just so you can do better the next time or that we can take a retest and do better on, on the next time you take it. Those are, that is that type of stress when we, well, those of us versed in Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, there's a certain amount of stress that's good. We want challenges in our lives. We want things, we don't always want things to be easy for our students because everything is easy means there's not going to be a lot of growth there. So we want there to be challenges. We want students sometimes to fail, sometimes to struggle, and then we stand in the place to help them overcome those challenges and problem solve, learn, cope. But toxic stress is that severe chronic um, exposure to prolonged stressors. And it could include things like institutionalized racism. And that's something that some of us are blind to. And tomorrow night, we're going to do a roundtable um, on um, how to be an anti-racist. And a, a lot of us who haven't experienced racism, we haven't, ex or sexism, we haven't experienced what it's like to um, have hate thrown at us because of our sexual orientation or our gender identity. Um, we can be blind to the stresses that some other people who are marginalized or victimized uh, or who are dealing with some form of, form of ism we can be blind to that, but when prolonged exposure to that can be, can be a form of toxic stress. And we need to be aware of that just because we're not experiencing it doesn't other people aren't. Chronic stress uh, on the physical body leads to um, high blood pressure, arrhythmias, increases in something called C-reactive protein, which is correlated with heart disease, inflammation, insulin resistance, obesity, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, a lowered immune response leading to more infections. So when we are stressed out, the immune system is dampened, making us more likely to get sick. So let's look at some other connections that they found in this ACEs study. Four or more ACEs study results in a four to 12 fold increase in alcoholism, drug abuse, depression, and suicide attempts. Four or more ACEs results in a two to four fold increase in smoking, poor self-rated health, and a higher rate of STDs. Four or more ACEs results in a 1.4 to 1.6 fold increase in physical inactivity and severe obesity. And an ACEs, your ACEs score has a significant relationship to ischemic heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, skeletal fractures, and liver disease. This is huge. This is huge. It's not just like kids have some trauma, they have a little bit of trouble when they grow up. This is, there, are, there are a wide range of really serious physical and mental health outcomes. So check out this video. I think this is the one with Nadine Burke, um, who's a doctor. High doses of adversity can change the structure and function of children's developing brains, their developing immune system, their developing hormonal systems and even the way their DNA is read and transcribed. Those changes are what we now refer to as the toxic stress response. Okay, as a doctor, I may be the one who's screening for adverse childhood experiences, but I might see that child at the most, you know, a couple times a year. But educators deliver the daily doses of healing interactions that truly are the antidote to toxic stress. And so the opportunity to do things like social emotional learning, to give children tools to understand how to recognize what's going on with them and then how to respond, especially to be able to calm their bodies down, truly is healing.
If you have a child who is being defiant, who is acting out, who is having a terrible time with impulse control, especially if they're experiencing high doses of adversity at home, suspending them so that they can go home and be in that environment may be doing more harm than good. We obviously need school safety policies and policies to support the orderly functioning of the school environment, but things like in-school suspensions, things like restorative justice, literally the time and space to allow those adrenaline and cortisol levels to come down. And it could be 15 minutes to have, you know, time and space in a quiet area to get back to self-regulation. That's a way to work with a child's biology instead of working against the child's biology. We have uh, an overactive stress response, there's cortisol, there's adrenaline, there's all these stress hormones, and those are what leads to long-term harm. So I just went through the science and said, okay, well, what does the opposite? And it turns out that meditation, and I was skeptical at first, meditation helps to regulate the part of the brain associated with recovery post-provocation. It's associated with reduced levels of cortisol and other stress hormones and also reduced physiologic indicators, things like blood pressure and heart rate. After reading that literature, I implemented a program in my clinical practice where we really taught mindfulness practices as part of our treatment protocol for kids with toxic stress. This is why I'm, I'm such a proponent of mindfulness and why we started with the mindfulness practice, because it starts with you. We have a tendency in education to think that everything starts with, okay, what do I need to do with my students, right? What, because they're the ones with the issue. It starts with us and our inner lives. We practice mindfulness. We gain in, in, uh, peace inside ourselves. We can then kind of work with students, introduce them to some mindfulness practices, and then help them gain some resiliency or gain at least a sense of a greater capacity to regulate their emotions and not blow up and not um, not get into fight or flight mode where they're going to make rash decisions. High dose. Let's take a look at some of the mental impacts of uh, trauma. So this is a this is a very unscientific graphic, but let's just say these are the average stress levels. So we're, we're trying to stay in that green zone. We're trying to stay regulated. And then something happens, maybe we're on edge. So for you, let's say you're, you get in some traffic and now you're like, oh man, I might be late. You're getting on edge. And then all of a sudden someone cuts you off and, uh, or someone calls you on the phone and says, Hey, you know, something, something else that's stressful, that's making you maybe rush even more. Um, and then you see an accident or whatever. So then you become dysregulated. I think about like, if you guys know who the incredible Hulk is, it's like the incredible Hulk is kind of like the opposite of this. Cause he, he turns green when he gets really upset. But the idea here is that on an average person, you've got a, a certain amount of space where you stay regulated and then certain factors, certain stimuli uh, will put you on edge and then you can get uh, dysregulated. A person who's experiencing toxic levels of stress has a much smaller bullseye for hitting that regulated zone. So it's much easier for them to be put on edge and then to go into dysregulation. What we want to do is we want to do some kind of practice and mindfulness is to me, Dr. Um, Nadine Burke Harris, I think she's the one who just, was, just spoke and several other people are recommending that mindfulness is a really effective and powerful tool for expanding that regulated zone, making it, making it uh, not harder, but making it less likely for us to get to get put on edge and to become dysregulated. So in other words, it will take more of a stimulus to, for us to get out of that regulated zone. So we wanna expand that regulated zone. We can do that through mindfulness practice. And there's a lot of different reasons why that happens. And I do a whole session on mindfulness and unpack all the, the neuroscience behind it and like the default mode network and, and the different types of brain architecture that get, gets altered through regular mindfulness practice. But I promise you, if you do that practice that we did on the front end of this training, if you do that reg, uh, regularly, you'll notice in yourself that that green zone becomes, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. 
So it doesn't mean that you'll never get on edge. It doesn't mean you'll never become dysregulated, but you're less likely to your trigger. Uh, you know, you don't have as short a, a fuse, if you will. People who have experienced trauma can sometimes uh, uh, develop something called post-traumatic stress disorder. You've heard of PTSD probably before. Uh, we hear that sometimes with soldiers who go to war and, and see all kinds of the horrors of wars, terrible things happen to them, and they come back home and that, that trauma they experienced uh, can lead to flashbacks, bad dreams, fearful thoughts, avoidance, hyperarousal, reactivity, poor attention and memory, negative thoughts and moods and dissociation. Um, but PTSD can also affect, can affect you in a lot of different types of trauma, whether you've been abused or neglected or seen violence in your community, you can also get a form of PTSD that results in a lot of these symptoms as well. And what happens is when, and the doctor mentioned this, is that young people, the, the front part of the brain there that's highlighted in blue is called the prefrontal cortex. That is the relatively newer part of the mammalian brain that we have evolved to develop. develop. Where that amygdala and hippocampus is, that, that is called the limbic system. It's more the primitive, or we call the, rep, the, some people call it the reptilian part of the brain, that more primal part that's just instinctual. So that is, that is really connected with survival. Like we go into survival mode to fight or flight when the amygdala is activated. Um, the prefrontal cortex is in, helps us uh, sort of regulate that limbic system so it doesn't hijack us. So in other words, we think through things like you might get scared about something. Like, for example, let's say a boogie, like you when you're little, you, you're convinced there's a boogeyman under your bed, Right. And then all of a sudden you just get freaked out and you're yelling for your mom or your dad and your, your heart's racing because you're convinced there's this boogeyman under your, under your bed or your closet and, 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 and there's no boogeyman there. As we get older and the prefrontal cortex develops, the prefrontal cortex says, there's no such thing as the boogeyman. You've never seen a boogeyman. There's, you've, you've lived in this house for a while. Like there's no boogeyman. Chill out. You don't have to yell and scream. And so you, it kind of like is telling the primitive part of the brain, just chill out. I don't, I don't need to go into fight or flight. We're not going to have to fight or run away from a boogeyman. We're, we're cool. Right. So the prefrontal cortex helps regulate emotions. It helps us to focus and plan. It helps to, uh, us just to pay attention to things. So it's a really important part of the brain that we need. The problem is that it's still developing in kids. It's still wiring itself all the way up into your mid twenties is still sort of configuring itself and it, and it can continue to, to, to be rewired, but in terms of its development is still developing uh, well into your twenties. When you go through toxic levels of stress due to trauma, you can have an impaired prefrontal cortex. You actually have smaller prefrontal cortex volume and this results in deficits in executive functioning. It results in impulsive behavior and hyperactivity. So you will see this in students who are experiencing trauma. You'll see those types of, of uh, maladaptive behaviors. And again, when I talked about in the beginning, we're, we're going to get away from this idea that there are bad kids and we're going to go back and say, what has happened? Not like, what's wrong with you? You're a bad kid. Why are you so bad? Why don't you behave? We're going to get out of that old school mentality, and we're going to start to look at what are the causes and conditions of maladaptive behavior. Part of that is an impaired prefrontal cortex because the prefrontal cortex is no longer communicating with those primitive parts. And when those primitive parts get activated, there's nothing there to sort of regulate or govern that, that reaction, which is going to be a survival reaction, which is going to be you're going to see it as anger, yelling, acting out, punching, hitting, kicking, throwing things, right? Cussing at the teacher because they have no sort of regulator over that, those primal uh, emotions and instincts. Guess what helps develop the prefrontal cortex? And we can see this through functional MRI scans. We can actually help grow gray matter in the prefrontal cortex by regularly practicing mindfulness. So let's look at uh, the academic and uh, uh, behavioral impacts. Um, so trauma uh, and toxic stress results in language development issues, vocabulary development, phonological awareness issues, syntax error issues and errors, 
uh, problems with attention and remembering decision-making, filtering distractions. And there's a cumulative effect of trauma over generations. And they, for short, this is called TTT, which stands for transgenerational transmission of trauma. And this is really interesting. It gets into something called epigenetics. We actually can inherit, inher inherit trauma over generations. This is why going back and looking at racism or traumatic uh, things that are experienced by certain groups of people, that can go down a generation and it's actually carried through the genes and expressed epigen through epigenetics, um, that trauma can, can play itself out. So it's not just environmental, there's also a genetic component to trauma as well. This is a really powerful quote. The behavior isn't the kid. The behavior is a symptom of, a symptom of what's going on in their life, their life. And I want you to really, I really want you to think about that. Instead of the next time there's a, a, a child does something, ask yourself if they had a better strategy, if they had a better way of acting, don't you think they would have used it? And this gets into a little bit of a philosophical discussion here, a little bit of a philosophical argument. What at the moment a maladaptive behavior takes place, why is it taking place? It's very simplistic, too simplistic to just say, because the child's a bad kid, because it's a bad kid. And that's what the bad kid does. There's all of these causes and conditions. Some of them are genetic. Some of it has to do with the way their brain is currently wired. Some of it is environmental and what they're experiencing at home or in their community or out in the hallway when you're not looking or on the bus on the way to school. There's a whole host of environmental things that have happened prior to that behavior. So it could have happened earlier that day, earlier that week, earlier that month, year, or when they were a baby. Those things led, all those causal links, there was a chain of causal links interconnected that led up to that particular moment. And that child can't time travel backwards to fix any of it which is why the maladaptive behavior happens now. So the only thing we can do is we see this maladaptive behavior and we have to, instead of taking it as a personal attack on us, instead of making it personal about them, what we have to do is say, what is happening with this child? What has happened to this child? What were the causes and conditions that led up to this? Let's unravel that and figure it out together with the child. If the parents can hopefully help out, we can try to get them on board or guardians, uh, grandparents. Let's get them on board and figure out what's going on because this is communication. All behavior is communication of something. But what we do as teachers is we take it as a personal, uh, with the way we interpret the communication is we take it as a personal thing against us when actually it could be completely disconnected from us. It is completely, it could be something that's been triggered within them, a memory, something that they've dissociated from. So they don't even make the conscious connection between why they're behaving the way they are and the, the trauma that happened to them three or four years ago. So they can't even articulate to you why the behavior happens, but there's always reasons for it. And there, there, are, there are good ways and great ways to address that. And then there are ways that are going to essentially either create more trauma for the student or entrench that student in, the, in that behavior. And, and they're gonna then believe the narrative that they're the bad kid, right? Sometimes it's, it's, this is their cry for attention. Sometimes the behavior is, I need someone to pay attention to me, to care about me, because I'm, I'm not getting that. Sometimes for some kids, it's, I can't be, I'm not the smartest kid in the class. I'm not the star quarterback. I'm not the cheerleader. I'm not the student body president. I'm not the popular kid. I'm not the rich kid. And all human beings crave identity. And some, and it would be better to be the bad kid, the class clown, the one who gets in trouble, the rebel, than to be nobody. 
So some students, this is the, the identity and it's the identity they've built. They get into middle school and high school. This is the reputation they have. This, the teachers talk about them and call them the bad kid. They, they have this, they carry this label, they carry this narrative and this belief about themselves this is an identity they've built up. Just like the kid who's, who's get, gets straight A's and who's really the good kid and the teacher's pet, they've got an identity that they carry with them. This is an identity that some kids carry with them. And the, and the fundamental misconception is that there's something inherently wrong with this kid, that they're like an evil seed or they were born to be bad. And then we've got to get out of that antiquated concept. There are reasons for the behavior. It is a symptom of what's going on in their lives. And I'm going to end with this. Um, there's the impacts of teachers working with traumatized students, there, there's a whole host of impacts. When you are working regularly with traumatized students, and all of us are, because if you look at the ACEs score, there's going to be some kids in your class who are dealing with trauma. It's just the odds are you're dealing with multiple students throughout the day who are dealing with trauma. And you can suffer from what's called vicarious trauma, compassion, fatigue, and burnout. So vicarious trauma is, is defined as the cumulative transformation transformation of the inner experience resulting from empathic engagement with students traumatic experiences okay so you're you're experiencing the trauma because you care and love these kids so much that you're taking on in an empathic way these students traumatic experiences then there's something called compassion fatigue it's the natural and consequent behaviors and emotions resulting from knowing about traumatizing events experienced by someone else. It's that stress resulting from helping or wanting to help a traumatized or suffering person. And then there's the burnout from, the, from prolonged stress or frustration resulting in exhaustion of physical strength, emotional strength, and or motivation. And that goes back to what we talked about, the surge capacity in the beginning. We're all human beings. And I think we forget that when we talk about... Um, schools. We're so focused on test scores. We're so focused on pedagogy and all. We're so focused on a lot of things that make it look like a mechanistic process, like schools are a machine producing out students who create, who do well in tests, on standardized tests. And we forget that there's human beings in, in these buildings and we're all struggling. And then, and we're all had this added layer of stress due to the pandemic that is created downstream um, hardships on everybody. And so we are seeing record levels of, of stress and um, anxiety and depression. Um, there's just, it's, it's, it's at, it was already at epidemic levels beforehand, but now it's, um, it's really, really a crisis. A couple of misconceptions about tra trauma-informed teaching, I'm going to wrap up. Um, and this is important because you're going to have some pushback when you talk about being trauma informed. Some people think um, have some misconceptions about it. Number one, trauma informed education is solely about a student's ACEs score. That is not correct. There, there's a lot more to it than that. The educators must know a student's ACEs score to successfully intervene. That's not true. You don't have to probe them and ask them, uh, you know, you know about these things. You can, you, you should, when you're trauma informed, you're gonna, you're going to just learn to respond to, um, to things in a universal way without even, you don't have to know the, the score. Trauma-informed education is about fixing kids. It's, remember, we're getting out of this idea that they're, they're broken or that, that they're fundamentally flawed or evil or bad, getting away from that notion. Trauma-informed educators don't uh, give student consequences for inappropriate behavior. Very common misconception that we're coddling kids or we're not you know, getting... Um, giving them severe enough consequences. That's not true. What we're doing, though, is rather than ignoring the causal link to the maladaptive behavior and just giving a, a consequence, we are, we're going to dig in and do the hard work of finding out what's happened to these students so that we can help them once and for all uh, get out of this sort of like uh, Skinner type behaviorist approach of like, well, they just need to have a harsh enough punishment to learn their lesson. Well, sure, there should there have to be consequences for people's safety, but that's not going to that's not going to get to the root cause of, of the, the behavioral issue. 
Number five, sometimes you have to escalate a confrontation with a student to calm them down. It's always best to regulate, to keep calm, and that will help calm a student who's experiencing that anger, that frustration, that fear. A dysregulated adult cannot regulate a dysregulated child. I want you to remember that. A dysregulated adult cannot regulate a dysregulated child, which is why you've got to practice mindfulness as well. Raising your level of intensity is not a strategy, strategy that works. And the sixth thing is that I'm a teacher, not a therapist. This isn't my job. Nope, you're not a therapist. And no, you shouldn't be in the, the, you know, the habit of giving kids therapy. But you've got to become trauma-informed. You've got to understand what students are going through and what are the appropriate ways for you to respond. And the number one strategy for you is to learn how to regulate your own emotions. And you can do that through a mindfulness practice. I'm going to uh, have to stop there, but um, I want to tell everybody who's been tuning in tonight, thank you for tuning in. I hope this has been a helpful session for you. Um, if you have questions or comments, leave them in the comments. I'll continue to read them. You can uh, email me. I'm going to share my screen one more time because I do want to leave my contact information for anybody who wants to uh, um, give me just one minute here. All right. Ah, uh, let me get back here. Um, so, oops, let's get right past it. There it is. Um, there's my contact information and you can learn more about trauma-informed practices at teachersalign.org. It's a website that I started and you can also um, join the movement to help deliver the type of schools that our students and educators deserve. And that is the SCEA. I'm so proud to be a part of the SCEA and the NEA. Just go to our website at the SCEA.org and you can learn all, all about the South Carolina Education Association, our commitment to being trauma-informed, our commitment to help supporting teachers, supporting students in building just humanistic schools, schools that don't just look at standardized test scores, but help um, help educators and students flourish as human beings. So I hope that you will join that movement and we would love to have you as a part of it. And I'd love to hear more from you. So please comment on this video and uh, reach out to me at toddshull at gmail.com if you have any questions. And if you'd like to bring this type of professional learning to your school, you can also email me uh, or head over to the plan website, which will be in the comments and click on that, fill out one of our request forms, and we'll get in touch with you. And uh, I'll come, or we can get, there's lots of other great presenters, TJ Rumler, Kara, Kara Lee, uh, they're in the upstate. They, they do amazing work, and they're experts on this stuff. They can take you to the next level. This was the basics. Kara and TJ can take you to the whole a whole other level when it comes to being uh, trauma-informed. So you can um, check the, them out there on our website as well. So thank you. I hope you have a great evening. And I uh, hope everybody has a wonderful Thanksgiving and we'll see you at our next webinar. You can check out our webinars uh, on the Planet website. Thanks so much. Have a great night.